Everybody. Uh, my name is Lenore von Stein, and this is an episode of The Facts. Uh, this is The Facts is uh, music and talk, uh, separate. Uh, and this is a, a discussion episode, and we're talking about the reasons for racism, the second part of a discussion about the reasons for racism. And I'm here with Carol Lang, uh, who is professor of history at the Bronx Community College. Um, and we, we, we talked about the, the racism, the economic tool, and or you know, almost purely an economic tool. There's no such thing as race, so it's just jive. You know, it's just it's just created to serve a purpose, an idea to serve a purpose to separate out peoples and throw them against one another, and 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 justify you know why I'm the king and why you're washing the toilet. You know, and that's that's the story, um, and. So we, we talked we, in the last conversation. We got to the uh, the Civil War, and sort of skimmed over that terrible uh, r restoration after the Civil War and the nightmare of <laughs> the late 1900s, the, of the late whatever that th those centuries. And so here we are in the era of. Uh, it does seem to be very hard to get rid of racism because it. It, it, it's held up with something else, the f foundational thing, this economic stuff. It's really hard to lose it, right? To, to I think it's impossible. I don't think you're going to, as much as there'll be upswelling of people against racism, it's completely endemic in to American society. And so unless people see that their interests at whites and blacks and Asians and all different groups of people have the same interests, and join together in, uh, you know, as opposed to in be in opposition to each other. There's no ending this because, you know, I mean, d I could just see it working as a teacher at Bronx Community College. Most of my students are, they're all working class students, and they come from working class neighborhoods, either from the United States or from the Dominican Republic or you know wherever else they come from, and their education is really horrible. They, uh, some of them are are not even, I mean, they're just barely literate, some of them. Yes. Some of them, you know, just can't really decipher, I, I'm not even talking about words, you know, but in terms of concepts, because of the fact that they haven't been educated to think in all critically, you know, they're, and now education is even worse, because now it's teaching to the test, so that you're not supposed, you don't have time to be creative, even if you wanted to be creative. But you know, it, one of the things about this show in Al Jazeera that I had watched yesterday, um, there was really a clear example of how little money is going into education, especially in the South, as opposed to in the North, and especially in wealthier, I mean, it's like twice as much money is going into the North and into the South. And part, part of it has to do with the legacy of Reconstruction, because they didn't want to raise taxes. And so you didn't have any money for education or welfare or or anything, and it was th at that point racism was already in. Why did they want to raise taxes during Reconstruction? Well, Reconstruction was the period in which the United States could have gone in a variety of different ways, and because of the northern capitalists who wanted to maintain labor peace in the South and also in the North, they want they ended up putting back the same plantation owners, the same. Uh, Jefferson Davis, who was the head yes. of, right? He spent two years in jail. Now, I, this guy committed treason. 750,000 people died because of the Civil War. He spent two years in jail. The vice president, who was the head of the Confederacy, he became the, the governor or senator of Georgia. So what the American ruling class wanted during that time was stability. And so the way to do that was to bring back the people who were going to make sure that there was going to be stability and that there was going to be labor peace and that blacks were going to be back on the plantation making their cotton for the northern textile mills and that you know it, the, the the American the the northern ruling class Republican Party became very conservative because wealth was really the most important thing 
for them. So the railroads, Wall Street became incredibly important, insurance companies. So that's why they didn't want to increase taxes, because it, it would increase taxes on them? It, it would increase taxes on, on southern plantation owners who, who were part of the club. Right, and didn't want to pay the taxes, and plus they didn't want to have education and all those things for poor people, because they didn't, they weren't concerned about the well-being of southern blacks or southern whites. They thought themselves superior to Southern whites as much as they thought themselves superior to Southern blacks, that nobody deserved, you know, it, it was all, you know, a ruse to, to get the Southern whites on their side, but basically the tenant farmers, the sharecroppers, they did very poorly and they were very poor. So Reconstruction sort of reestablished the old relationship that it existed, except that it put the, the political sphere in the hands of the North and the northern capitalists as opposed to the southern plantation owners who were in some ways like a junior partner to the railroads and Wall Street and the insurance companies and things like that. So, you know, so the, the essentially the southern whites and uh, the poor whites and poor blacks really ended up in the same place as they ha had been before the Civil War and Reconstruction, that little period in 1865 to 1877 where blacks were doing incredibly well, they were becoming lawyers and doctors and going to school, was wiped out with the help of the Klan. I mean, talk about terrorism. Those people burned people alive, hung people, lynched them. Between 1877 and 1950, there were 4,000 lynchings in the United States. And, and that wasn't just blacks. I, qu I think a quarter was white. But anybody who helped blacks were lynched and, you know, basically the Klan and the ruling class said, you know, we're not going to go back to the days of that small period. And ultimately in 1896, we had Plessy versus Ferguson in the Supreme Court, which basically was the separate but equal. So it's institutionalized in every single fashion, in the Supreme Court, in the education system, you name it. Racism is institutionalized. So then you had colored bathrooms, you had, you know, colored, um, what you call water fountains, movie theaters, education, everything. It was completely institutionalized. And one of the other things that allowed for two things that allowed for the mass incarceration was the Thirteenth Amendment. And I've had arguments with a number of people who are into civil, you know, into the Civil War period doesn't just say that all men are free, no matter what. You can't put somebody in bondage because of their race. It says everybody is free unless they've committed a crime. And that committed, if you look at the 13th Amendment, it opened the door for a lot of the black codes. And I don't, I'm not saying that Lincoln meant for it to, because L Lincoln was the one that pushed the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment. But it opened the door. So if I spit or, or play gamble and I could go to jail for 10 years and it be fined so much I'll never be able to pay it off and exactly. I just become a servant again. And spitting was one of the crimes. Walking near a railroad track was one of the crimes. Some things that were like misdemeanors became felonies. So that they were able to have a convict labor system after that because so many blacks were incarcerated after that and, they, and there was no money in the treasuries in many of these states that were bankrupt and they didn't want to tax the wealthy that they leased out all these black people who basically they incarcerated and really enslaved again so that they can work on roads and things like that, public works, and the, it would fill the tills of the state treasuries. And all these people ended up either dying on the job or living out their lives in, in prison. So it was completely institutionalized by the black codes. So the, 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 the codes of today with, the, with people in, j in jail for an enormous amounts of time, sometimes for incredible, you know, I stole a television set when I was 19 and I'm, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a who's gal right. or I smoked a joint, you know, right. using, using exactly. the war on drugs, which was a, right. which was a, is a, a colossal um, error. I, that's putting it nicely, right? It's a colossal meanness, uh, the, the uh, cruelty that that has wreaked. Uh, and uh, when, 
I mean, I, I would assume, you know, since since racism at, in, in, is is whole is there to hold up an, an unequal distribution of wealth, that it, who is on top and who is on bottom could easily change. I mean, who is the desired race of the weak and who is the less desired race of the weak could, you know, it doesn't change in a week. It takes centuries and centuries, right? But it, as long as that as long as that concept is in place, uh, it. it 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 can change, right? It can it can. I, I I mean personally, I don't see black people ever being on the top without there being you know a revolution essentially in the United States, because whites, you know, philosophically are so and educationally and in every single way, you know, that it, the mindset it, it's you know as I said in the beginning, it was like it's almost in the American DNA that people who are not white and who are not white males, basically, are lesser. And there's always the degree of lesser. Um, and you know, so unless something profound changes, I don't see that ever really, e I, I mean, I think things are, there'll be race riots. I mean, there have been race riots. And a lot of them have been on the part of whites. I mean, in 1919, there was a, a race riot in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because you have these black people who, uh, it's called Black Wall Street. And, you know, essentially the black community was doing pretty well for the most part. And the white community, which had come back from the war, and nobody was doing well during this period really, had no jobs, they were living, you know, hand to mouth. They resented the fact that blacks were doing, you know, pretty well under the circumstances and they just rioted. and burned down people's homes, killed people, shot them, and, you know, drove a, a number of people out of the area. Um, and that's really, and that was happening actually throughout 1919. There was a lot of riots on the part of whites because after the war, you know, when the, con the economy collapses, because you don't have people who are, you know, making guns and all kinds of things that you need for war. The economy bas basically collapses, and you have all these people coming back who are seeking jobs. And if the jobs aren't there, then all that racism that is, you know, part of American society gets whipped up by, you know, people who need to get rid of the perceived enemy, which, you know, at that point was the blacks. And I don't see that, you know, ever flipping over. I, I see, you know, m my hope is is that I see blacks and whites and working class people getting together and getting rid of capitalism and this, you know, need to pit people against each other or, you know, the environment. It, it's being ravaged. The capitalists are ravaging the environment and everything is about profit in this society. And so, you know, rather than using solar energy, you have oil and fuel, all the dirtiest of the dirty, in order to make the immediate profit, you know, the billions of dollars that they reek in. And unless those people, you know, the 0 0.1 are, you know, forced out, then um, I think things are, and racism. I mean, every day I, I listen to a news report and some other, somebody was just shot on, on the subway just a couple of days ago by this corrections officer. Yes. Uh, it would, they got into an argument, the guy was walking off the subway and he was shot. You know, because it's so much a part of how whites, especially l law enforcement, see black people. And they think that they're entitled, just like in Ferguson. That guy, his argument, with Aaron Wilson's argument was that, I felt like a little being next to this big hulky guy and therefore I was frightened. And that's what's inculcated in the American mentality. That's inculcated in the American educational system. And you know, when you have an inequality in terms of how much money you're gonna provide for schools, you're gonna have people who are in poor communities who are less educated than people who are in wealthy communities. And then therefore, they have the right to lead because they're more educated and smarter and you know, et cetera. 
So in this way, I mean, this is two examples of, uh, I, I, I had a friendship with a woman from Sarajevo at the beginning mm -hmm. of that war. And she got a phone call, come home, because, you know, we got to worry about the Muslims. And she said, we never had to worry about the Muslims. My brother-in-law is Muslim. I don't understand what this is all about. It was so easy to right. open up that the fissure that existed, you know, uh, there was enough of a fissure. And e even though they had lived together fairly right. peacefully, it, it was easy if you wanted if you wanted to lead people to get to say, oh, no, you, you, you really do have to worry about these people. They're, they're going to hurt you. And, and um, it was uh, that's uh, one example, and the 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 as people begin to understand more about the uh, unfairness, the profound unfairness of the judicial system in the United States. Um, I mean, it, to change this whole situation, you you think there's no changing it without real change. Okay. Do you see any? incremental steps to that real change, incremental steps maybe through the pathways of racism, changing that uh, as people, I mean, this this profound unfairness of the judicial system, uh, getting anybody's backup that used to be uh, uh, along with, I mean, that they, they, people see it, that they, they, I grew up in a housing project and, and I knew the cops were beating up Friday night. Mm -hmm. And um, and for a lot of other people, that was and it was very hard. It's very hard to to marry reality to a middle class world. You know, it's just not. You know, it doesn't marry well. Right. I I mean, I think blacks see it. You know, most black people that I know, I live in the Bronx. I work at Bronx Community. So the people that I associate the most with are people who are black and Latin. So they see it. They know what the story is. They you know, they often ask me, you know, so what happened after Occupy or something, you know, because I talk about politics in my classroom. And, you know, so there's a certain amount of cynicism that people have. And then, unfortunately, that leads to just explosions as opposed to a real systematic organization that will ultimately know how to get rid of the problem in the first place, which, you know, in my opinion is capitalism. I mean, here we have a black president who, he, he can barely get the word racism out of his mouth. He, you know, he, um, when it came to Ferguson, it, it, people had to riot and they had to go out every single day in freezing cold weather to get him to get Eric Calder to come to, you know, Ferguson to do something about it. And, and yeah, there's, now they figured out their systemic racism. And Darren Wilson, who was the cop, mm -hmm. gets off, uh, what does that say to people, except for the fact that the people, you know, Obama got a lot of money from Wall Street. He gets a lot of money from the oil companies. He's not going to, you know, he knows which side his bread is buttered on, and you can't, all of these people, I mean, they talk about it themselves, how they have to spend all their time campaigning for money. So if that's the case, they have to answer to the same people. They have to answer to the wealthy, and if they're going to answer to the wealthy, then they're going to have to do the bidding. And they're all, you know, prostitutes, in my opinion. So you can't really, the only way that you can make those kind of incremental changes is if you fight. If you really have, like, even during the Civil War, you had to have 600 to 750,000 people be killed in order to even have that small window of, you know, fairness for blacks in the South, where, you know, you had an, a Reconstruction period where people managed to, the first thing they did was look for their families because the kids were sold away, you know, to other plantations. So people were roaming around the South looking around for their families. And they established schools and became lawyers and doctors and all kinds of things. But that couldn't remain because American capitalism cannot allow that. So that, you know, the very nature of capitalism itself calls for the pitting of people against each other and the ma maintenance of racism. So that white workers, as you said before when you asked about how can people seem to vote against their own interests, I mean, a lot of people aren't voting, but also, you know, the, there's a conflation of social things with economic things. And, you know, most people are, are raised in the Bible Belt who vote for these people if they do vote. 
and um, their their education is one that's not based on a liberal education, so that they end up, you know, conflating social issues a lot of times with economic issues. But they, you know, when they're interviewed, they want, you know, if you ask them the right question, they want health care. They want, you know, a, a good minimum wage. They want a, a decent place to live. They want all those things. But the sort of way that they're asked brings people into believing that they are just, you know, these hicks who don't know any better and they want racism and all. But, but if you ask the other questions, do you want health care? Do you want a decent job? They all want that. They all want the same thing. I, I, I want to tell the audience, just for posterity, because that's why I think about this stuff, that we are filming this in March of 2015. So that is maybe three, four months into this latest battle about this, these, these, uh, these uh, killings of uh, young black men. They were just killings that people reacted to. They weren't unique, uh, right? They, they, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, and uh, But people did react to it in Ferguson, the place that we're referring to, where they uh, have established a way of, of making a living off, off uh, arresting people uh, for jaywalking and um, whatever they can come up with, which might be what Mike Brown was reacting to, uh, in order to keep their coffers filled and, and the people who work for the city to get their paycheck, right? It's, uh, it's a, it's a money-making procedure. Uh, very clearly, and 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 uh, even Holder came up with that. You know, finally, uh, had to had to cop to that. You know that that's the way this is running, and that it's not unique. Uh, that that it's a it's a it's a it's a business plan in many parts of of the United States in many municipal agencies, and it's certainly a business plan in uh, you know in private industry to to shaft the the people who work there and the. You know, I, one of the things that happened um, several years ago it used to be when you turned on TV. One of the things I watched in New York One, turn on TV and there would be somebody who you know robbed a liquor store or done something like that, and they used to describe them as black, da 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 da. And then finally, the Great Hallelujah Day came, and they no longer described the person that way. They said, you know, five foot ten, wearing a the, you know hoodie or something, whatever it was. And I thought, oh, we've we've made a step. We no longer uh, use that one. I mean, there are other descriptions uh, that, uh, for instance, um, I'm, I'm a musician, and, and, and uh, when I read about famous musicians, uh, composers, uh, da da da, a Jew from Austria. Right. And uh, what what is is there something? I was just in my class. We were studying uh, metamorphosis, Kafka's metamorphosis, and they talked. And I said, what is the purpose of putting that his his religion right. or lack of, you know, probably, uh, in there. It, 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 it's, it's another form of racism. And, and then the, 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 the oppressed by this racism, you know, if we talk Israel, you know, the oppressed by this racism, going back and creating uh, a, an oppression for other people and continuing the kind of, uh, uh, continuing this kind of tribalism, separatism as, a, you know, as a way to survive. Uh, and um, it just, it, 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 it has a, <laughs> uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, it's, you know, it manifests itself and, s and you still see that, a Jew from da da and now you're going to see a Muslim from da 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 da, right. da. It's, yeah. it's a, you know, and then maybe that'll fade away, maybe that'll fade away, you know, and you'll just do sort of this guy, you know, rob the liquor store. It hasn't faded away because even in, I teach a labor history class and at Bronx Community and in the book that we use, which is problematic. I mean, textbooks in general are pretty problematic, but when the guy was describing Samuel Gompers, who was the head of the AFL, he made sure to say, or she, I'm not sure who the author was, made sure to say that he, he was a Jew from blah, 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 where as opposed to other people who were indigenous Americans or Native Americans, I don't mean you know Indians, but I mean white people. Um, it doesn't describe what their mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. background. No, they're just was a from human being, right? They were just this guy, Terence Powderly, who was the head of the Knights of Labor or something like that. And it's all designed. I'm not sure that that this person consciously realized it, but it's but it's so much a part of racism in the United States 
that people are identified in those ways so that you keep the identification of the those people being the problem. You know, so the Jew is the problem, or the black is the problem, and, or the Muslim is the problem, and you have to continue to identify them so that it's always in everybody's consciousness that they are the problem, and he, the media's got a wide breadth. They can talk to lots of people. So they're the problem as opposed to, you know, just this particular individual or some the problem deriving from somewhere else. So it's, it's, it's institutionalized in the media, it's institutionalized in education, it's institutionalized in every single way. Especially, you know, I, uh, and this is my own, I don't know whether anybody else thinks this, but the United States had a particular problem in the sense that you have these colonists coming from another country to a place that's already, you know, there Got are people. people, there are millions of people that living here. So as opposed to having uh, racism, is not quite as bad in Europe as it is in the United States, although there are people who may disagree with me about that. But, but in the United States, you have to deal with not only the annihilation of a people, but you have now an integration of Africans. You have all these immigrants coming in. You have this Mexican war that the United States you know, in, in gets involved in because it wants to get all that land for the southern plantation owners. There's so many different groups of people. How are we going to deal with this? So, you know, in order to be able, you can't just say, like in England, I'm English, and people emigrated there. Here, it's so many different races of people that you have to get s some sort of identification, which is, I think, why we have the Pledge of Allegiance so much more than most other places. But the whole race issue in the United States has been so, you know, difficult because of the so many different groups of people and in incorporating Mexicans, Hispanics, blacks, all different groups of people that basically the whole identification of race and, and ethnicity becomes like a major thing for the American psyche as opposed to somebody who's English, who knows they're English, or French, who knows they're French because those countries had long been established yes, yes. as opposed to the way America got going. You know, so. So if you take your, in these last 27 seconds. Oh. <laughs> if, you, if you, wonderful, Carol, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, if you, if you uh, take those lenses out your eyes, you know, and you see that, oh, this is me, you know, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is my uncle, you know, this is, you know, uh, then, uh, then history and the world looks quite different, right? So listen, this is the facts. Um, Carol Lang, uh, Reasons for Racism, bye.